السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى وأصحابه وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد الحمد لله once again um Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me to be able to come and talk about our series dealing with the story of the the stories of the companions and once again we uh talked about how important it is to have this uh this information in this history because in order to fully understand Islam we have to understand the statement as to why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the best generation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever created was the sahaba and so therefore from all of the um the stories that we've had so far which i want to say has probably been at least about 14 or 15 we understand that there are verses on, from the quran that were revealed as it related to some of the uh trials and tribulations that these particular sahaba had gone through we talked about baraka um also known as um ayman we've talked about usama bin zaid we've talked about abdullah ibn um maktum We've talked about uh Kab ibn Malik, we've talked about Salman al-Farisi, we've talked about um Ikrima ibn Abu Jahal, we talked about um uh, Musayyab ibn uh, Umair, uh Sa'd ibn Muwayf, um uh Amar bin Yasir. Um and it's and the list goes on. I'm trying to remember um uh trying to uh, remember who else we've talked about but it's been quite a few and we see some of the 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 trials that they've gone through the struggles that they've gone through and the reward alhamdulillah that they had gone through in terms of submitting themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> so um who are we talking about today so there is a famous hadith Abu Yahya Suhaib ibn Sinan reported that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said how wonderful is the case of a believer there is good for him in everything and this applies only to a believer if as prosperity attends him he expresses gratitude to Allah and that's good for him and if adversity befalls him he endures it patiently and that's better for him as well and this hadith this famous hadith is narrated by no other than Abu Yahya Suhaib bin Sunan which is better also known as Suhaib uh, bin Sinan al-Rumi alhamdulillah so a little bit of background about they call him a uh, um uh brother Suhaib al-Rumi about 25 years before the start of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's mission um so this is around the middle of the 6th century and era by the name of Sinan ibn Malik was a governor um of the city called Al Ubadal uh, Ubaidullah um on behalf of the Persian empire so remember we talked about in our series of dealing with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we talked about how you had some arab tribes who had um like alliances with the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire. So Al-Rumi, his father was a governor who um was uh, on behalf of the Persian Empire, this particular land which is around Basra now. And so it said that El- he lived a, a very luxurious life on, on a, in an actual palace. And he had several children and the one that he was his favorite is no other than Suhaib and it talked about that he was he had blonde hair he had very um a fair complexion and it said that his father loved him a great deal and the reason why um I'm bringing up as far as his appearance inshallah we'll talk about later 
So uh, one day, Suhaib's mother and other members of her household have went to a, um, a neighboring village, El Athani, and for like some, you know, kind of like a picnic type of thing. And they were relaxing and they were enjoying themselves. And then they got attacked by a raiding party from who? The Byzantine Empire. So the Persians and the Byzantine Empire, formerly known as the Romans, because remember, the Romans ended up converting when they converted to Christianity, and now it became known as Byzantine. And so these soldiers, they raided um, uh, th this particular gathering. So his mother and other members who were involved in this picnic, so Suhaib were, uh, uh, ended up getting kidnapped. And he was, slow, he was uh, sold in the slave markets of the Byzantine Empire, and he was sold from person to person to person to person. So subhanAllah, here you got this person. His father is a leader of this particular area. He was, he was uh, used to living in a palace. So he was young. He was around five years old when this happened. But he had come from a lifestyle where he enjoyed life a great deal. He had mother, he had a father, kind of like a little bit different than some of the other stories that we heard about some of the other Sahabas that um, were former slaves as well. And so he sold off to these different uh, slave markets. And this went on for about 25 years of him being a slave. And so uh, he saw the corruption. And this is one of the things too, that a lot of the people who are living under Byzantine rule saw the corruption and they hated, they were like tyrants. And matter of fact, just as a, a little bit of a, um, going off a little bit, that when the Muslims had actually taken over parts where the Byzantines had rule, ruled, the people were actually happy that they were gone and they saw the justice and the humanity of Islam. And so they welcomed it. And because the Persian, the, um, sorry, the Byzantine empire was extremely harsh. And so Suhaib, he saw this growing up and he said, a society like this can only be purified by a deluge. OK, so he used to think. And you know what? Something I thought about. SubhanAllah, when you don't really necessarily have everything or um, compared to a person who has everything, sometimes a person who has everything, they don't necessarily have the deep contemplation of uh, about life in general, you know. And so a person coming from somebody that has really doesn't really have anything they're able to be a little a lot more clear minded as to whatever is going on in the society you know the the social ills of the society um so on and so forth so he used to look at the the Byzantine empire and would say like or in in the, in that particular setting and say these people were like savages and they were very immoral they were corrupt they was tyrants and he hated being in that society and so he was an individual who grew up, he knew how to speak Greek because he was an Arab uh, as far as him being born, but he was taken when he was five years old. So he's in these aristocratic situations because remember, poor people did not own slaves. So anybody who had a slave more than likely were people who had higher up and had a lot of money. So he had to learn the language of the Byzantine Empire, which was Greek. And then he actually uh, kind of forgot how to speak out of it. Um, but he, this longing, he never forgot where he came from. So he wasn't that young as to where he didn't remember where he came from and he wanted to be free and be with his people. So the first opportunity that he got, he escaped and he headed straight for Mecca as a place of refuge and asylum. Now, um, <laughs> subhanAllah, do you think that they was coming to look for him? No. There's probably, they probably had a thousand other slaves. He ran away. They got 25 years out of them. So there's a good possibility that they're not looking for him. Okay. So he got to, as soon as he, he uh, had a chance, he escaped out of, um, out of that situation and he went headed to Mecca. And when he arrived there, he was known as El Rumi or the Byzantine because he had a particularly heavy speech and for his blonde hair. And uh, he actually um, started doing well. And he uh, started trading 
and he started doing well and he became quite rich um, when he when he became uh, in the society of Mecca. So one day he returned to one of his journeys and he was told that the Muhammad Sallallahu was Wasallam, the son of Abdullah, had begun calling people in this belief to one God. And he commanded them to do good, to do good works, prohibited them from shameful and reprehensible deeds. And he immediately inquired about the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam and where did he stay? OK, because remember, even though he's doing well, he saw what what these corrupt societies were like. And Mecca actually was no different. And so when he heard something that is kind of going in line with what he and how he always felt about things, then subhanAllah, this was something that he um, immediately wanted to gravitate towards. So he was told that the Prophet Sallallahu is in the house of Arakan ibn Abi Arakan. And they told him to be careful. If the Quraysh um, sees you, then it's going to be terrible for you. And you are a stranger here and there is no bond. So once again, he's not, he doesn't have, he's not from Quraysh. He's not from any powerful tribe. So they saying, listen, they will not hesitate. They telling them, they warning them, they will not hesitate to, to mess you up if they find out that you're trying to inquire about being a Muslim or if you become a Muslim. And they saying, listen, we and we and we're not going to help you either. We might be cool, but we're not coming to your aid as a result. So if you're going to do you're going to meet with this person, you better do it in secret. So the uh, story goes that Suhaib, he cautiously went to El Ar the house of El Arkham. And Alhamdulillah, who does he see at the door of El Arkham? No other than Amar ibn Yasser. Alhamdulillah. So we've talked about Amar. Amar uh, was his family had they were. They were slaves at one time. They had just kind of gotten freed, you know, and um, but he was known for being a, a, a slave. And so he asked him, he hesitated and he asked Amar, said, well, you know, what are you doing here? And then Amar said, oh, well, what are you doing here? And so he said, you know, I, I want to go directly to this person who is talking and saying these things about it's only one God and doing good works and so on and so forth. So Alhamdulillah, Amar said, I'm here for the exact same reason. So they went in there together with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessing and they entered and they listened to what the Prophet sallallahu wa sallam was saying and they was ready immediately and convinced about the Prophet sallallahu wa sallam's message. And a light entered and faith entered into their hearts and they uh, they took their fealty to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they declared, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. And then they spent the entire day with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And at night, in the midst of darkness, they left the house and they were extremely happy and they were just aesthetic. You know, I'm sorry, the the um I'm having brain freezes here. They were extremely happy that they had accepted Islam. And this is something, as many of us know, that when we when we take our shahada, people just say that they have this overwhelming feeling of happiness and joy. And the sun, like a, a burden has been lifted off of them when they accept Islam. The Quraysh, they learned about his acceptance of Islam. And then they started persecuting him. And he bore the same persecution as Bilal and Amar and Sumeya and Khabab and many others who professed Islam. Now, why did he have the same type of situation as them? Because Bilal was a former slave or was a slave at the time that he accepted Islam. Amar, Sumeya, um, uh, Khabab, all slaves, no tribal protection, really. None of that. So it was easier for them to persecute them. Because remember, even though there were Muslims like Hudayfa, um, Ibn Utbah, he had accepted Islam, but he came from a very, his father was very influential and very powerful. So if somebody did something to Hudayfa, they had to deal with his family. So if somebody messed with Amar, if somebody messed with um, Sumeya, somebody messed with Bilal, somebody messed with al Rumi, nothing necessarily was going to happen to them, period. OK, so when the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam had given the permission for the uh, Muslims to migrate to Medina, he this this is how close Suhaib was with the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Wasallam. 
the famous and the famous trip in the the uh the escape that we all know in Islamic history of Abu Bakr and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam leaving, sneaking out of Mecca because they were trying to kill him, or he got word they were going to try to kill him, that actually Suhaib was supposed to be the third person to go with them, other than the guy that was with them. So he was supposed to go with Abu Bakr and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when they were making their great escape out of Mecca. And so they, uh, the Quraysh, they had gotten word that Suhaib was going to um, run, that he had talked about migrating. They knew Muslims were, the Muslims were migrating to Medina. And remember, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the last person to, to leave. You want to make sure that all of the followers um, had got out of there, who were going to migrate, had got out of uh, Mecca, and he was the last one, so to speak, in terms of who were going to go to Medina and stay. And so the, the Quraysh, they found out that he was getting ready to try to leave. And they actually, <laughs> this is how desperate they were. They actually had guards standing out to make sure that he did not migrate to, to Medina. And so one cold night, he pretended to have stomach problems. So it basically like he pretended he had diarrhea and he had to keep going to the bathroom. That's what he did. And so, um, he told his captors, he, uh, you know, listen, man, I got to keep, I got to go to the bathroom. So he kept going, kept going, kept going, acting like he had to go to the bathroom. And then this is, listen what they said. Don't worry, El, El Lot and El Uza are keeping him busy with his stomach. So they figured because he had rejected the idolatry and the gods that they were worshiping, that God, that the Lot and Uza was punishing him with this diarrhea that he was having. And so, alhamdulillah, when they became relaxed, and he did that a couple of times, they fell asleep and he quietly slipped out and um, as if he was going to the bathroom again and he armed himself and he read it, he um, got on his amount and he headed to Medina. And so when they woke up, they realized that he was gone and they got on their horses and they actually caught up with him. And when he saw them, he went up a hill. And he had a bow and he had his arrow and he shouted, oh, men of Quraysh, you know, by Allah, that I am one of the best archers and aim uh, uh, and my aim is unerring. By Allah, if you come near me with each arrow I have, I shall kill one of you. Then I shall strike my uh, strike you with my sword. So the Quraysh said that one of the Quraysh men said, by God, we shall not let you escape from us with your life and money. Right. Because he made a lot of money amongst them. And he said, you came to Mecca weak and poor and you have acquired what you have, what you acquired. So they mad like you're going to come. First of all, you're not from amongst us. So, you know, remember, they were like cl very clannish tribal people. So you're not one of us. Number one. Number two, we know that you used to be a slave. Number three, not only that, you came in here and you was poor with no tribal protection. And we basically, what they said, we allowed you to make money. That's a slick way of saying it. We allowed you to make money. And now you re you rejected our gods. You followed this person who's an enemy of us. And you think that you're getting ready to leave with your life and with your money? That's not going to happen. So he says, listen, what if I, what, what if I was to leave my wealth to you? And he said, would you get out of my way? And they agreed. So he told them, uh, uh, where his money was in, in his house in, in Mecca. And then they allowed him to go. They, they stopped chasing him. And um, so he set off going towards uh, Medina and um, the, the prospect of seeing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a, a drive. Couldn't wait to see the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so when Suhaib reached Kuba, which we know this is where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stopped before he went to Medina, so Suhaib ended up doing the same thing. So it's just outside of Medina. Many of us who have made Hajj and we visited Medina, we've been in Masjid um, Kuba before. This is where Suhaib, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and many other Muslims have stopped. But, um, <clears throat> and a Masjid was built there. But um, he was overjoyed when he saw Suhaib, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he saw him. And then the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he makes a, a statement. He says, um, 
your transaction has been fruitful. Oh, Abu Yahya, your transaction has been fruitful. And he said this three times. And he said that Suhaib's face was beaming with happiness. And he said, by Allah, no one has come before me to you. Oh, messenger of Allah, only Jabril could have told you something like that. So the Prophet Sallallahu knew of the transaction that happened when he was running and said, look, take all my, here's my money, take it, leave me alone. All I want to do is migrate to the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as a result of that action in which Suhaib did, remember we talked about that there, the re, it's important to, um, to, to learn about the Sahaba because verses on the Quran was revealed as it related to them. So it gives us more of a better understanding of the Quran. And it said, many of the scholars say that this verse was revealed about Suhaib where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and there is a type of man who gives his life to earn the pleasure of Allah. And Allah is full of kindness to his servants. And this is in Surah Al-Baqarah, the 207th ayat. So this is referring um, to Suhaib. And um, he was um, commended by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it, as preceding the Byzantines in Islam, alhamdulillah. And uh, because we know that the Byzantines, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala predicted, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also had made in hadith how they would um, take over the lands of the Persians and the Byzantines. So he made this, gave this honor to Suhaib that you're the first Roman or the first Byzantine to accept Islam, alhamdulillah. Suhaib was known for his generosity and he used to be given um, uh, money and from the public treasury at one time to help the poor and those in distress. And he was a good example in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and he gives his food for the love of Allah to the needy and the orphan and the captives. So, and he was so generous that Umar ibn al-Khattab one time remarked to him, I've seen you giving out so much food that you appear to be too extravagant. And Suhaib replied, I heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, the best of you is the one who gives out food. So alhamdulillah, he was known for being extremely generous, especially in this, in, in this particular situation. So he said that his um, piety also stood out a great deal in Umar ibn al-Khattab um, to lead the Muslims in the period between his death and the choosing of his successor. And alhamdulillah, we know that um, during Fajr prayer, Umar was stabbed by um, uh, a Magian called Abu Lutlu. And um, when he was dying, he didn't die immediately. So uh, he had summoned Uthman, he summoned Ali, he summoned uh, Zubair, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, and Sa uh, Sa'ad ibn uh, Abi Waqas. And he told Suhaib to lead the Salah. All right. So that lets you know, especially how. Umar ibn al-Khattab was, that's a, a great, that says, a, that speaks volumes as it relates to Suhaib's character, because he didn't want, he didn't tell any of them to lead the Salah. He said, let Suhaib lead the Salah while he was, um, you know, while he was dying, mashallah, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had taken his soul. So um, it shows that Backgrounds was uh, integrated in honor of um, community and Islam, regardless of an individual's tribe, color, social economic status, so on and so forth. And one of the reasons why I described him, him having blonde hair, very fair complected, they were not like that in, in Arabia. You understand? I mean, they were known as reddish, dark. And so he obviously stood out a great deal to them. So he was not necessarily amongst them in terms of being a part of them. And, oh, no, somebody from Quraysh has to lead the Salah. Somebody from Banu this got to do this. Somebody from Banu La. It's all based upon a person's taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then this is showing that you have the Muawadhan and Abyssinian. You have somebody from uh, who looks different, who's not necessarily amongst them and their whole thing uh, is leading everybody in the Salah in, in this particular time, so on and so forth, right? And so one time during the um, time of the Prophet Sallallahu a hypocrite by the name of Qas, uh, Qais Ibn Mutatiya, he tried to pour some discourse 
in uh, sections of the community. And this is what sh uh, shaitanic type of people do. Um, you have a thriving situation, a thriving Muslim community, and somebody comes and they say, you know, whoever sent them, Iblis, whoever sends them to do this stuff and try to figure that they can pick weaker elements of the community in order to, to, to sow some type of discord. And so what he did is we know that the, the, the Munafi King would do anything and everything in order to cause a problem in the Muslim community. And so the whole thing of the they they showed outwardly that they had a thing uh, that they loved Islam, but inwardly they hated Islam. So anything they could try to do is um, they, they would try to do it in order to cause some type of issue. And the subhanAllah, this is something when I was researching this, this is another tactic that they used. So who was sitting in this halakha? Simon al farsi Suhaib ibn Rumi, Bilal ibn Rabah, um, it was sitting in this halakha. And so he came to them and he said, the Aus and the Khazraj have stood up in defense of this man. Talking about Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What are these uh, people doing here with him? <laughs> you know what I mean? Trying to make him feel less. So it said that uh, 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 Saad, he got angry. When he heard this, he got angry, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he had the they had the tradition of um, calling the Adhan in order to get people to come. So if it wasn't time for the Salah and the Adhan was going off, there was some issue that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted to deal with. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said that listen, um, in short, that uh, it's only one God but Allah. And that if you if you speak Arabic, then you're an Arab. <laughs> so he crushed all of that type of stuff. Any type of fitna that they, that they tried to, to, to come with, he smashed all of that stuff by saying that. Okay. And so alhamdulillah, he passed away um, during the time of Uthman around the age of 73. You know what I mean? So alhamdulillah, it's a beautiful story as it relates to um, Islam being fully integrated and once again showing that this religion is from Allah it's not anything in terms of an elitist religion it's not somebody if you look a certain type of way if you can speak a certain type of way if you whatever it's based upon la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah and those who um who practice the deen and they practice it to the utmost alhamdulillah so any uh questions inshallah that's the the end of um of that particular story. If anybody got any questions, inshallah, the floor is open. Any questions on Facebook, if anybody is watching? Okay, alhamdulillah. All right, so inshallah, um, we will, we will uh, be together next Sunday. And I want to say we have about six more sahabas to do um and then this series on stories of the companions inshallah is going to be over and then we'll just concentrate on dealing with um life of the prophet on wednesdays as alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh uh for this information for the story may i ask how you spell his name Okay, so it's spelled a couple different ways. So you may see S U H A I B, or you may see it S U H A U B. El Rumi, A L hyphen R U M I. If you pull that up, inshallah, you'll you'll be able to see it. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, alhamdulillah. Anything else? I'm trying to keep up with, with the uh, Sahara. Alhamdulillah. And, uh, this is good history for us. Alhamdulillah. So I'm trying to be accurate and because I keep notes. Alhamdulillah. 
Okay. Yep. So we got this lot of uh this these could be movies. <laughs> these could be more, their lives could be movies. Some of the, this stuff is 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 uh, amazing. And um just some of the uh, the dedication. I mean, I'm really just floored by the way that they were dedicated to Islam, you know, really. And and it's unfortunate that we don't see in our day and age this type of dedication in a lot of cases now. But you know, they uh well, I mean, he gave, you know, subhanAllah, I was really, <laughs> for some reason, I was mad when he had to give up his money to, to migrate. I'm like, oh, man, he had he probably had a lot of money, too. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, but subhanAllah, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ended up revealing a verse from the Quran about him as it relate to him doing that. And and uh, Allah knows best. He probably, you know, number one, he did have the better ending because he ended up with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he had a, a life uh, filled with, with uh, wonderful good deeds, inshallah. And we already know that the ultimate uh, wealth is, inshallah, a person being in paradise. So that's the ultimate wealth. You know what I mean? So, but alhamdulillah, he, he did. He sacrificed all his money so he can be with the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his brothers in Medina. And um, and alhamdulillah, you know, they, he is it's great. It's a great story. It's a great story. Okay, alhamdulillah. Once again, if any mistakes that was made, that's from me. Anybody got any good, good from this is, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik wa ashadu wa na ilaha ila anta wa astaghfiruk wa atubu ulaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.